Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Great Vic for our evening service. If this is your church home or you're just visiting with us this evening, you're very, very welcome. Uh, I was told at the door some uh, folks from Florida have come in this evening, so you're very welcome. I'm assuming that's you sitting there. <laughs> you're very, very welcome this evening as well. Um, we're here together as always to worship the living God, and this is an incredible privilege for us to be able to be together, to lift our eyes to the fountain of life and to be refreshed together in the Lord's presence. So hope you're encouraged as we gather together this evening. In the middle of the service, we'll be having communion together. Uh, everyone that knows and loves the Lord uh, and is in good standing with their local church is welcome to share in that time. Uh, if you've come in without uh, picking up some bread uh, and the cup, um, you can at some point nip back and get that just before we break the bread together. Just a few announcements before our call to worship. Um, this Tuesday is the beginning of Hope Explored. Um, there's still a number of flyers out there that you can take and uh, give to someone and invite them to come along. Um, it's 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. in our week calendar in the bullet and it says 7.30, but it's actually a 7 p.m. start time on uh, Tuesday evening, um, running over the next three Tuesday evenings. So if you know anyone that uh, is open and interested in exploring the hope we have in Jesus, uh, this will be a really accessible evening uh, and we'd still encourage you to invite someone along to that. Then on Wednesday evening, we'll have uh, our small groups um, that meet in the respective homes as we continue our studies in the book of James. Then this Saturday coming, uh, we have an AIM supporters event that's happening at the church. And we just wanted to flag this up because Rosina is a dear friend uh, of Lindsay and myself, our friend from Madagascar. Uh, when we were there, she helped us immensely. Um, she loves the Lord. She has an incredible story. And uh, she's going to be here at the AIM morning. So if you have a free morning and you're interested in that, um, please do make the effort to come along. I, I know it'll, it'll not let you down. Uh, then uh, we have a membership class on Wednesday the 31st of May at 6.30 p.m. If you've been here for a while and you're beginning to think about church membership, joining us formally as a member, that will be a class for you to come along to. Now there's lots of other things uh, that Simon mentioned this morning and that are in the bulletin. Do make sure uh, you pick up the bulletin and uh, see everything in there. Now for our call to worship, I want us to hear the words of Psalm 103 an exuberant psalm where David just bursts into praise in the opening few verses. He writes, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Such wonderful blessings we have from the hand of the Lord. Let's stand together as we sing our first hymn and respond in praise.
seated and let's continue our worship in prayer. Let's pray together. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, once again, we bow together before you and we just open our hearts to you again, our God. You know everything about us. As we sit here, you know what's been going on in our lives. You know the stresses and the joys and everything in between. You know the things that we're encouraged about and the things that we're struggling with. You know all about our relationships, uh, the, the good relationships and the relationships that are troubled. You know all about what's going on in our hearts, whether we feel like we're struggling or whether we're feeling good this evening. And our God, you are the one in whom is everything we need, however we're feeling this evening, because you are the author of life. You are the fountain of everything that satisfies our longing souls. You're the one that has searched us and you know us. And so we just open our hearts again this evening. We bow before you and we worship and adore you. You are great and greatly to be praised, our God. You are holy and righteous and good and gracious and compassionate and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Your mercies are new every morning. You are kind. Thank you, Father, for your patience towards us. You're a good Father. And we thank you that in your Son we have a treasure. For, Father, we have sinned against you with our words and our thoughts and our deeds. We want to come again and say we're sorry, Lord, sorry for our selfishness, sorry for our materialism, sorry for our idolatry, our laziness. We're sorry, Lord, for how cold our hearts are towards you at times, how we let so many things fill our lives and push you out from the center that that the place that you should be in. Lord, we're sorry for our sin. And if you marked our transgressions, Lord, who among us could stand? But thank you, Father, that with you there is forgiveness. And as Psalm 103 goes on to say, you do not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. But as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is your steadfast love to those who fear you. And as far as the east is from the west, so far do you remove our transgressions from us. Father, thank you that because of Jesus, there's forgiveness, complete forgiveness. United to him, our old sinful self is crucified with Christ. United to him, our debts are paid. Your judgments against us are satisfied and all of our sin is canceled. The record of debts is taken away. We're forgiven everything. And united to Jesus and his resurrection, we are given righteousness. We're credited his righteousness. We are given new life and we stand forgiven in Jesus, totally washed from our sin, counted righteous, totally loved and accepted. We have your approval. You're happy with us in Christ. And we thank you. And we pray that you would strengthen us by your spirit this evening. We need the power of your Holy Spirit to grasp what we have in the treasure that is Christ. And we pray, Lord, for the power of your spirit to be present with us this evening. Just at work, speaking, guiding, convicting, leading us. Just guiding our response to what we hear. Guiding us so that as we sing, it's not just lips, but from our hearts. Just help us to worship well this evening, we pray. Come and meet us and bless and keep us and encourage us and refresh us together, for we need it so much, Lord. And we thank you that you are so willing as our good Father to give us what we need. And we ask for that tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you have your Bible, please do open to the book of Acts, 
chapter 12. We'll be continuing our series in this book this evening, and Beth's going to come and read for us from verse 1 to 25. Thanks, Beth. Right, Acts chapter 12 and the first 25 verses. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of the unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Now when Herod was about to bring him out, on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them of its own accord, and they went out along one street. And immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. And when he knocked the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you are out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so. And they kept saying, it is his angel. But Peter continued knocking. And when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of prison. And he said, tell these things to James and to the brothers. Then he departed and went to another place. Now when day came, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. And after Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries 
and ordered that they should be put to death. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent some time there. Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and they came to him with one accord. And having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace, because their country depended on the king's country for food. On an appointed day, Herod put on his robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivering an oration to them. And the people were shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. Immediately, an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. But the word of God increased and multiplied. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. Great, thank you very much for reading that for us, Beth. Let's stand again and sing of the wonderful love and kindness of the Lord.
it is always a great privilege to be together to remember the Lord's death in the way he appointed. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he broke bread. In that simple act, he said, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. And so from that moment down through the years across the nations where believers have gathered together in Jesus' name in local churches, they've practiced the simple act of breaking bread and eating it together to remember everything that Christ accomplished through his death. We also took a, take a cup because Jesus said after he broke the bread, take this cup. He said, it's my blood. It's the blood of the new covenant. It speaks of everything Christ would accomplish through his death on the cross. And so the church has taken a cup and as we have drunk the wine together, we have proclaimed the Lord's death and our hope in him. Jesus established this meal, as I said, on the night he was betrayed. And in Mark chapter 14, we read this. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, that is, eating with his disciples. And after blessing it, he broke it and he gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them. They all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. As we were thinking about this morning, because we are united together in Christ, we are all one, the family of God, brothers and sisters in Christ. Together we come to the source of our life. We all come and by eating the bread and drinking the cup, we're actually proclaiming that I need this savior and the life that there is in him. And we all meet at the source. We all need Jesus together. And so in him we meet together and here we are. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. And so as we eat the bread and drink the cup this evening, and as Christ is present with us spiritually in a special way, let's remember also our togetherness as we meet at the fountain. Let's be still for a few moments. Let's just search our hearts. If you need to get the bread and the cup, if you're sharing in this time, then please do just be ready for that. But let's take a few moments to be still. And then I'll lead us in a prayer and we'll break the bread together. Father, as we reflected this morning, we remember that once we were slaves to sin, held in bondage, blind to the glory that there is in Jesus. And Father, thank you that you sent your son to step down into our darkness, to come as our redeemer, the one who would set us free from the shackles of sin that bound us. And thank you, Father, for the death of your son and his powerful resurrection. Thank you that in Jesus Christ alone there is forgiveness. And as we eat the bread together this evening, Father, we want to give you thanks. Father, we want to thank you so much that as we are together in this moment by the presence of the Holy Spirit, the, we know the, the risen Christ who is among us. And we know that in this moment there is special refreshment together as in your presence we remember Christ's death and everything he accomplished through it. And so we pray that you would nourish us spiritually. That you would lift our hearts up to the risen Christ. And that together we would know in this moment that, that we are alive in him. So bless us together. Thank you for this bread. We lay our sins down again and we embrace the Son by faith. The one who is the fountain who washes us from every sin. 
So thank you for this time together. We rejoice together in Jesus' name. Amen. If you can have your bread at the ready, please. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Let's eat together as one. Father, as we thank you for the bread and what it points to, the brokenness of Jesus to make us whole, we thank you for this cup that reminds us of his blood shed so that we could be cleansed from every sin. Thank you, Father, for the peace that we have with you because of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. If you can have your cup at the ready, please. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's drink together as one. Let's again just take a moment to settle our hearts. And then I'll lead us in our prayers, giving thanks to the Lord and interceding for our world. Let's be still. Father, thank you for those words we've been singing. Grace and love like mighty rivers poured incessant from above. And heaven's peace and perfect justice kissed a guilty world with love. Father, there is great truth there. Peace and justice upheld through the death of Christ and that death becoming a fountain of grace and love, a place where we are cleansed from every sin. The judgments against us have been taken away in your son. Thank you that in Christ there's life. Outside of Christ there is no life. But thank you that united to him by faith there is life with you. And Father, we want to continue to pray for our world, for unreached people groups, we want to pray that that saving life of Christ, that message of hope in him, would just continue to make progress across all the nations. We continue to pray for Mauritania, this country that we've committed to praying for. We pray for gospel light and grace to just be spread abroad in that country. Strengthen your people there for the glory of your name. We continue to pray for places where there are conflicts. We think of ongoing restlessness in Syria. We think of Yemen this evening. We continue to pray for Ukraine, Sudan, and other areas where there is conflict and maybe lesser known areas of conflict that are not documented as well in the news. Oh Lord, may the peace of Christ just penetrate into the darkness of this world and bring rest. We pray for our own uh, country and continue to pray for the reestablishment of good governance here. We pray for peace. We pray for reconciliation. 
We pray for the gospel to flourish as Stephen prayed this morning. Our country's greatest need is a fresh renewing of the power of the, the Holy Spirit, bringing revival and renewal spiritually as people realize their need of Christ and turn to him. And Lord, we also pray for ourselves. You know, as we have already said, what's going on in our lives. And we just come and cast all our cares on you again, knowing that you care for us. Lord, help us in our weakness. Meet us, touch us, bless us, keep us. We remember those in hospital this evening, like Joe Belch. We remember those that are unwell or can't make it out for various reasons. For those in our fellowship who are just discouraged and struggling, just be a light onto us. And Lord, as we turn to your word now and as Simon comes and helps us to see uh, what you have for us here in this next part of Acts chapter 12, we just pray that you would strengthen and help Simon, that you would give us attentive ears, that our hearts would be open. There is so much wonderful truth here for us. Challenge us, stir us, convict us and help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Simon. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, it is great to be back together in the book of Acts uh, this evening. If you've got a Bible with you, do um, turn back to chapter 12, which uh, Beth um, just read for us a little bit earlier. As we begin, um, I want to ask you a question. As you look at the world around you, close to home and further afield, as you look at the world, and particularly as you see the widespread persecution and opposition that God's people are facing, do you ever find yourselves wondering, is God really able to overcome all of this? Is God's plan really still on track? Or has all of this opposition and persecution caused the plan to take a bit of a detour? See, even here in Northern Ireland, we are facing increasing opposition, it seems, in all kinds of different ways. So how should we respond to these realities? Is God really at work? Can God really work even despite all that we see going on, going on around us, even through what we see going on around us. Well, here in Acts chapter 12 tonight, I think we see Luke's resounding answer to these kinds of questions. And his answer is absolutely yes. God can and will continue to work. In fact, Acts 12 is here, I think, to, to remind us and encourage us in the truth that our mighty God is at work, continues to be at work, even despite opposition that his people might face. And seeing that, I think, in Acts 12, ch chapter 12 tonight, is a bubble here to help us to increasingly trust, trust that that is the case, that our great and mighty God continues to be at work, even in these kind of situations, as desperate, as hopeless as they might first seem. See, last Sunday evening, we left encouraged, didn't we, if we were with us. The gospel, you see, in Acts is continuing to go out. Steve spoke about the gospel stone there being dropped into the pond of the world, and we see the ripples going further and further out, reaching now even the Gentiles, like those in Antioch. Do you remember, we read last week that there in Antioch, amongst the Gentiles, the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number who believed turned to the Lord. And later on in verse 24, Luke added that many, a great many people were added to the Lord. This is encouraging. The gospel is going out. But then into all of this encouragement comes the start of Acts chapter 12. If you look with me again there now, we read 
About that same time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. And we find out then that Peter is only kept alive as it is here during Passover. This is a time the Jews wouldn't have permitted for someone to be sentenced to death or killed. But as soon as that time is over, it's pretty clear what Herod's plans are. He's going to kill Peter too. From these verses, it seems clear that the devil is not about to let this continued spread of the gospel go on without some kind of fight. The trajectory here is of people from every nation, every tribe and tongue, one day worshipping the Lamb, worshipping Christ. Well, that kind of thing, that would be unthinkable for the devil, wouldn't it? And he's going to do whatever he can to stop it. So here, here's what's his plan. Well, in this case, strike right at the heart, right at the heart of the church, here in Jerusalem, where it all began where people would be continuing over the coming years to look for teaching, to look for encouragement, to look for guidance. And start with the apostles, right? First James, and now Peter. See, as we look at the situation there in verse 4, it is not looking good. Peter, soon to die, and then likely, surely, many more after that. So here's the question. Is God still at work? Can he overcome even a situation like this? Well, as we said, yes. As Luke is about to show us, he absolutely is. What we're going to see from verse 6 onwards this evening reminds us, and I hope will encourage us this evening, that even in a situation as desperate as this, our mighty God is able to overcome, to deliver, to deliver the oppressed, in this case Peter, and to judge the oppressor. Let's look at those two things in turn. First of all, if you turn with me to verses 6 to 11, let's see together first how God powerfully works to deliver the oppressed. As we've already said, in verse 6 we find Peter back in prison again. He's been there before, hasn't he? Acts 4, Acts 5. But this time, surely there is no escape. Look at the detail here. Verse 6, we read that Peter is sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains. And back in verse 4, if you look with me, we're told that four squads of soldiers are guarding him. A squad is four people. So here we see 16 people. 16 people guarding one person, Peter, who's chained. It isn't looking good. And this night, from what we're told in verse 6, well, it's going to be Peter's last. Herod is about to bring him out. The Passover finished. Next in line, Peter's execution. But as we see this, just notice one fascinating detail here in passing. Even as Peter likely knows, he must know, this is his final night here on earth. What's he doing? Sleeping. That's kind of incredible, isn't it, when you think about it? He's, in fact, he's sleeping so soundly. We read in verse 7, the angel literally has to come and strike Peter on the side to wake him up. Now, maybe Peter was just exhausted. But I think we are meant to see here something else. The trust that Peter seemingly has in his God that he really does have even this situation under his control. God is and will continue to be at work. Whether that looks like for Peter following after James and being a martyr, or whether that means God somehow rescues him. Either way, Peter is a man here able to sleep, to rest. Resting in the fact that no matter what, God has a plan for his life. He is above it all. It's a powerful example to follow, isn't it? Resting in God's plan for our lives, no matter what. If we think of all of our circumstances and situations. 
Can we trust God like this? Well, back to Peter. And we find out that for him, God's plan does mean deliverance and freedom. Just look how the story unfolds. Verse 7, this angel of the Lord stands next to Peter, shining a light into the cell. Eventually, then managing to wake Peter, Peter gets up, finds his chains simply fall off his hands. Verse 8, then we read that Peter obeys all that the angel tells him. He gets dressed, he wraps his cloak, and follows the angel. Verse 9. Now, comically even, this all seems to happen without Peter really properly waking up, doesn't it? Do you see in verse 9 there, he wonders, is this another vision? Just like the one I had a little while back in chapter 10. But no, it all continues on. And in verse 10, we then read that Peter passes by the first and the second guard, carrying on then until they reach the final iron gate, which swings open all by itself, leaving Peter on the street, a free man. And then with the angel now gone, at this point, verse 11, we read that Peter comes to himself. This wasn't a dream after all. This is actually happening, and he is free. And here's his conclusion, verse 11. Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me. This is Peter's point, and this is Luke's point, I think, in this passage as a whole. This has been the mighty, powerful hand of the Lord at work. The passage makes it clear, doesn't it? There is nothing here that Peter has done. He's he's been half asleep during all of this. This is the Lord's work. It is God who is powerfully delivering Peter. This just is who our God is. He is mightier than any oppressor of his people. Even the mightiest king or ruler here on earth, like Herod would have liked to have thought of himself. Psalm 2 verse 2 says this, The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. But verse 4 of the same psalm then tells us this, that he who sits in the heavens laughs. Isn't this a good example of Psalm 2 in action? Who is this Herod compared to God? What are his iron chains and gates? They're only things that God laughs at, that God can cause to fall off, open, at a simple, simple, single command. And as we see this, I think we should be encouraged again this evening. This really is who our God is. Often when we think of or pray for other believers who we hear of in desperate situations, or even when we just consider our own challenging circumstances or situations, I think we can deep down think, yes, I know who God is, but this really doesn't look good. What can God really do here? Well, here's the answer. Our sovereign, all-powerful God can do anything. He really can deliver that person. He really can help you in that circumstance or situation, if that's his will. Nothing is impossible for God. God doesn't bend his will to some oppressor or anyone else. No, God's will will be done. And if that's to work, as we see here, he is going to deliver his people. If that's what his plan is, he can and will do it. That is good news to remember this evening. But of course, As we consider this, right at the beginning of the passage, we also saw a different outcome, didn't we? For another of the apostles, James. Verse 2, he's killed by the sword. So what about James, we might well ask this evening? Why wasn't James delivered too? Well, the truth is, it's a good question. And we don't know the answer to that. But what we do know from what we've just seen, we do know what the answer isn't, don't we? 
It isn't that God wasn't able to save him. God absolutely was. He was able to save James, just as he saved Peter. This is where we bump up against our human limitations, isn't it? We, unlike God, are not sovereign. And we don't and we won't ever here on earth understand perfectly all that we see around us. Why some in these kinds of situations are saved, why some aren't. This isn't easy. There's no doubt about that. But this is why I think we also need, even in the situation of someone like James, to remember all that we do know about our God. That our God is good. That our God is just. But also, that God's greatest deliverance has already been given. Even to someone like James who isn't physically delivered in this passage. See, if you glance back and look back over verses 6 to 11 with me again now, what we actually see here is a glorious outline of the gospel. This is a lot linked to what Steve was speaking about this morning. Here's how one commentator sums it up. Chained and unable to escape, asleep in our sin. Insensitive to it until God sends his Holy Spirit to break our shackles and set us free. Isn't that our passage here? What Peter experiences? Listen to these words which we sang as we finished this morning from the hymn, And Can It Be? They pick up again on all of this. Long my imprisoned spirit lay, Fast bound in sin and nature's night, thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke just as here the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. The truth is that here on earth, we will not understand God's ways, his timings, his sovereign plan at all times. Why one person with so much life left to live, seemingly, they die while another lives. But what we can understand and remember is this, that all who die trusting in Jesus ultimately have been delivered, been set free from sin. And because of that, death, no matter when it comes to them, well, that will not be the end for them. So we see here, I think, the trust that we can have in our mighty and powerful God. Our mighty God does continue to be at work, despite opposition, overcoming, in Peter's case, overcoming that opposition. He's, God has delivered the oppressed, But then also see with me the second way that we see this. The second way that we see mentioned that God also judges the oppressor. For this, jump over to verses 18 to 23 with me. We'll come back to verses 12 to 17 in a little minute. First off, in verses 18 to 19, we see the result of what's just happened, of Peter's escape. That despite a frantic search, you can imagine it, can't you, with the the soldiers? And then a frantic search by Herod, Peter isn't found. And the result of this is that Herod ultimately commands that those soldiers who had let Peter escape, well, they're going to be put to death. That's what he commands, isn't it? Just think of Herod here. No grace, no mercy. He passes judgment and he condemns to death. Which is ironic, isn't it? Given what's to come. Look with me from verses 20 and onwards. Here we see more of Herod's character. There we read that he is angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. Seemingly, he stopped trade with these cities for some reason or another. And while he seems to relent, we read there that Blastus, uh, of Blastus, his personal chief of staff, he seems to get through to him, perhaps. Even there, even as he relents, it, it is still all about 
Herod and his own greatness, his reputation and fame. Look there in verse 21. In his royal robes, Herod delivers this oration. Presumably speaking here of his own greatness, of his grace and mercy as he seemingly relents on these cities and these people. To which they respond in verse 22. This is the voice of a God and not of a man. Do you remember in chapter 10 where Peter had immediately rebuked Cornelius when he bowed down and worshipped him? Well, here we see the opposite. From what Luke says in verse 23, we see here Herod accepting this praise, taking it all to himself. Not giving God the glory, but giving himself that glory. And the response is, as Luke says here, immediate. God judges Herod. Verse 23, we read, Immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory. And he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. What we see here is divine judgment, isn't it? by the powerful, mighty God on a wicked man. A man who had not only sought to oppress God's people, that's where this chapter started, but a man who had also then sought to steal God's glory for himself. Here we see the seemingly powerful king who had put James to death, who had looked to put Peter to death, who had commanded those guards be put to death, Well, he's not so powerful now, is he? He's condemned, put to death himself by the one true king. So much more powerful than Herod. And as we see this, again, I think it is meant to encourage us and to remind us our mighty God is still at work, even despite opposition. Yes, mighty rulers might come against God and his people, but God will judge them. He will judge the oppressor. He will judge those men and women. And their plans to stop the spread of the gospel, they will not prevail. Because who are they compared to the mighty, powerful God and all that he is? His plans will always prevail. Sometimes we will see that those plans involve a humbling, a judgment here on earth, just like with Herod. Sometimes that will be worked out in other ways. But make no mistake, no matter who comes against him, we can trust that God is at work. And we see that ultimately wrapped up in what Luke says in verse 24. See, initially at the start of the chapter, we were kind of left wondering, weren't we? Will the gospel continue this spread? Will those ripples continue on out to the ends of the earth? Now, because King Herod's standing in the way, isn't he? Doing all he can to stop it. Well, here's the result of all that we've just seen. Verse 24, but the word of God increased and multiplied. King Herod, he had done all he could to stop it, didn't he? But the word of God increased and multiplied. I hope that encourages you as much as it has encouraged me this past week. Our God is a mighty, powerful God, and no ruler, no prime minister, no influencer out there on the internet, wherever they are, nobody anywhere on earth can stand against God's work. Our mighty God is able to deliver the pressed. He will judge the oppressor. And whether we see either or both of those things happen here on earth or not, we know that both of those things will ultimately one day happen when each of us stands before the throne. And on that day, the oppressed from God's people, they will be lifted up. And on that day, even the mightiest oppressor 
who sets themselves against God, they will be brought low. I mean, even going beyond this passage, just think with me then, on through the centuries, since this all happened, the centuries, just think, how many other rulers or influential people have stood against God, stood against his people? There have been countless, aren't there? We couldn't even begin to number them. And yet, what is the situation today? There are more believers now, right to the ends of the earth, than there ever have been. John Lennon of the Beatles, he once famously said this, Christianity will go. It will vanish and shrink. I needn't argue about that. I'm right, and I'll be proved right. We're more popular than Jesus now. I don't know which will go first, rock and roll or Christianity. Well, John, here's what our passage tells us. It isn't going to be Christianity. Why? Because God is not going anywhere. He is the same mighty, powerful God who will deliver his people, who will judge those who stand against him. He is the same God today as he was in Herod's day, in Peter's day. And he is today continuing his same sovereign work. That's something to hope and trust in, isn't it? Sometimes we see exactly how this all works out. Sometimes we don't. But we can be sure God is at work. No one, no matter how worldly impressive or important or influential, will stop it. So if that is true, where does that leave us this evening? Well, I guess, first and foremost, I hope it leaves us rejoicing, leaving here encouraged, knowing that nothing and no one can stand in the way of our God. But what about us then? What part do we then have to play in all of this? Do we have a part to play? Well, yes. Actually, we see incredibly Our passage not only encourages us, you see, to remember the might of our God, to trust in him, but then it also calls us to be a part of his work. Incredibly, God has also chosen us as a means to his continuing work. And this is what we're going to see in the rest of our time together this evening. Here's the first and main way we see this. That God uses us in his work because specifically, Our mighty God is at work through prayer, through his people's prayers. I hope that some of you out there, as I've been speaking, have been thinking, but what about verse 5, Simon? (laughs) You missed it out. (laughs) Yeah, I absolutely did. We went straight, didn't we, from Peter being in prison in verse 4 to God's deliverance from verse 6 onwards. But sitting there gloriously, shining out in the middle of this passage, are these words from verse 5. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. This is no coincidence That in verse 4, we see Peter heavily guarded. And then in verse 6, we begin to see God's work in delivering him. With verse 5 sitting in the middle. This is no coincidence because verse 5 is the heart of all of this. Earnest prayer by God's people is the means by which we then see God working from verse 6 onwards. Now, as we see this, I want us to see two truths about prayer, two truths about prayer from our passage. In fact, more than that, I want us to see from this passage two reasons to be praying earnestly, just like the church did then, two encouragements that should spur us on. First off, it's that just as we've seen, as we pray, we pray to a God who really is mighty and powerful to answer to answer our prayers, no matter the situation, no matter how bad it is. See, we pray to a God who can answer. See, if, I, if I'm at home, say, at the end, of, at the end of a long day, 
I'm sitting on the sofa, I've got my feet up, feeling like, like I'll never move again. Anybody ever been in that kind of situation? But then you see, sometimes you realize, don't you, you really need a drink or maybe something, something to eat. What's your, what are your options? Well, well, for me, in my house, I guess there are three people, three people that I could ask in that situation. Let's go through them. Three-year-old Naomi. Naomi, I really need a drink of water. Not a chance. <laughs> I didn't even think she could carry her own cup of water, like a little yard between, between the, uh, the, the sink and her, the table. Well, how about almost six-year-old Lydia Grace? Well, possibly. She's getting there. I've seen her climb up onto the counter and get a cup. So I know know there's a chance she can do that. But I'm still not sure I'm 100% confident that there on the sofa I get my drink or my snack. So that leaves me with Heather, my wife. Yeah, sorry, Heather. You're the chosen one. Unless, of course, I see that Heather needs, needs to sit down even more than I do. In which case, those of you who we're doing marriage prep with at the moment, sacrificially, I still manage to get up and go and get myself a cup of water, her as well. But anyway, the point is this. We, I ask Heather. The point is this. We ask people who we know will actually be able to come through, to answer us, who will be able to do what we ask of them. And so it is here with the church in Acts 12. Seeing the desperate situation that Peter finds himself in, the church there, verse 5, desperately, they earnestly turn to the one person they know can answer them. God. See, it's there. They pray to God. They know the truth of all that we've seen up to this point this evening, don't they? That God is able to work even despite opposition. He can overcome opposition. He can overcome anything. So they plead with him in prayer. So much so that in verse 12, after Peter has escaped, we read of him going to Mary's house where in the middle of the night, Peter seems to interrupt the church's continued prayer meeting. That seems to be the picture. This isn't just the church earnestly praying for a few minutes and then moving on or for even just a few minutes a day. No, this seems to be an ongoing, concerted effort of prayer. We could even see this as a 24-hour prayer effort going on here. But now here's the funny thing about our passage. And, And I think we're meant to learn something from this. See, the church are praying here. And they're praying to God, presumably because they know that God is able to answer. But even still, if you look back with me at those verses we skipped, verses 13 and onwards, we see that the church is still surprised when he does. Look at what happens when Peter arrives at Mary's door. Verse 13, he knocks, and this servant girl, Rhoda, comes to answer. uh, As she forgets to open the door in her joy, goes back, tells the others, this great news, and what's their response? No way. They don't believe her. You're out of your mind, Rhoda. Must be an angel, some kind of guardian angel of Peter. It can't be Peter. Only Peter's continued knocking in verse 16 makes them investigate further. And when they do, they realize that it is actually Peter. And look at the end of verse 16. What's their response? They are amazed. Amazed. But Peter, you were in jail. But but Peter, how did you get here? What's going on? How did this happen? You can imagine all those kind of questions and more. And I'm asking Peter, and yet here are the answers. Here's the fundamental answer to all of those questions. The church prayed, the Lord answered. As Peter says to them in verse 17, here's his answer. The Lord brought me out of prison. As simple as that. As we see the believer's reaction here, again, here is the point, I think. We should pray to God because he really, actually can answer. He is a mighty God who is able to answer them. 
Answer our prayers. Like, like actually answer them. We pray, don't we? The church seems surprised here. But because of who we pray to, we don't need to be surprised. We shouldn't be surprised when God answers. We pray to a God who can answer all of our prayers. We genuinely can expect answers too. When we pray, let's pray expectantly. So that's our first reason from our passage to pray earnestly, to get praying together because we know that God is powerful to answer. Here's the second reason then. And again, I think we see this in the positioning here of verse 5 in our passage. It's the turning point in it all, isn't it? Peter in prison, verse 4, God works to save him, verse 6 onwards. Why? Because God has ordained that he will work through prayer. Verse 5 the people's prayers genuinely are a means through which God works. See, given who God is, he absolutely could have rescued Peter apart from prayer. But that isn't how God had ordained it to be. He ordained that the deliverance of Peter would come about through the means of prayer. And all of this is amazing. Because actually, it's something for us to get hard to get our heads around. But all this is amazing because it means that our prayers actually matter. When we pray, God works. Because that's how he has ordained it to be. And that, that means that that prayer that you prayed this morning, that prayer that you prayed this morning for that family member who's struggling, that prayer that you prayed for your non-Christian friend, that prayer that you prayed for the persecuted church in China or wherever it is, that prayer mattered. Isn't that incredible? Not only was your prayer heard by God, but, but it's powerful. Because it could be the means by which God has ordained that he will work. The way he's a work, he will work to encourage your family member to open your friend's eyes, to prevent that house church leader in China from being arrested. As I said, this is kind of hard for us to get our heads around, but it is absolutely amazing. We should pray because God genuinely works through our prayers. Our prayers change things. Our prayers accomplish things. As we look at the example of the church here, even with their surprise in verses 14 to 16. It's an inspiring one, I think, isn't it? What we see the church doing. It's an example to learn from and imitate. Are we meeting together like this, like the early church here, in earnest prayer to God? Yes, this is a particular moment of crisis in the early church, isn't it? But there are plenty of very, very big things for us to be earnestly praying about today too. People sick or struggling in the church. We've got a major building project going on. We've got a society that seems to increasingly be turning its back on Christianity and its morals and, and values. And we know, don't we, as we said at the beginning, of believers who right around the world now are facing imprisonment, death for the sake of Christ, just as Peter had faced here. Remembering all that, now imagine if we actually believed that our prayers for those things matters. And imagine if we remembered that as we pray, we are praying to a mighty God who is completely able to answer them. Wouldn't that leave us increasingly on our knees? Wanting to be more on our knees, praying to God more of the time. Wouldn't that leave us as a church not wondering, should I, hmm, should I come to that Wednesday night prayer meeting? But yeah, let's go, and then let's look for as many other opportunities to pray together as we can. It's so encouraging, for example, to hear of that group that are planning to meet here at the church at the same time as, as Hope Explored. Praying for it. That feels so in sync with what we see here in this passage, isn't it? 
a situation that we long for God to work in. How do we respond? We pray. We long, don't we, for people to hear about the deliverance of Jesus through that time in Hope Explored, to come to him for forgiveness. So we need, don't we, as a church, to be praying earnestly for that. In light of all of this, I'd really encourage you, get along to that maybe on Tuesday evening if you can. Plan, if you don't already, to come along as regularly as you can to the Wednesday prayer meetings. Maybe for you, those, those things are tricky. Maybe for you also another way, just to think. Think outside the box even. What would it look like for you to be meeting together with other believers here in the church to pray? Purposefully pray. Our passage this evening reminds us that right at the heart of God's work are his people's prayers. Let's not let it be said of us here at Great Vic. We don't have because we don't ask God. Oh, let's pray and earnestly seek him wherever and whenever we can. Finally, as we close, here's one more thing just to notice in passing. That just as God is at work through prayer, he is also at work through his word. And this is the second way that then I think we see ourselves playing our part in God's work. Look again at verse 24. We read there that the word of God increased and multiplied. How? Through his people. That's what we've seen right the way through Acts, isn't it? It's the witness of God's people. They're the ones spreading the word. It's God's work, but his people are a part of it. And that's what verse 25, I think, leads us on to, I think, as well. Up to now, the word of God has increased and multiplied as his people speak of Jesus. And now in verse 25, we see just the beginnings of how that's going to continue. Look at that. We see Barnabas and Saul. And then we also see this relatively unknown at this point, John Mark. Again, as we leave, I want this to encourage us this evening. There will be great preachers and teachers like Saul, like Paul, who God and can and will use. But there's also the John Marks, the everyday person. Both of those people can be involved in the work of God. Why? Because in the hands of both of them is the powerful word of God. Which back then was already increasingly in increasing and multiplying and which is continuing to do that. Knowing and trusting God is at work no matter the circumstances I think again encourages us to play our part. To speak the word of God boldly. Knowing God works through that for the growth of his kingdom. That's what we're going to go on to see. I hope you're excited about it in the next few chapters as we go into these missionary journeys. God's word is going to continue to change lives. God's word is going to speak hope to people. It's going to bring light into darkness. So let's this evening get speaking God's word boldly, knowing that it will not return to him empty, knowing that it will accomplish all that he purposes it to. Remembering all of these things, let's get praying and let's get speaking. Let's pray that as God's word goes out in hope explored and, and all kinds of different ways, that God would be at work. And let's speak wherever we can the word of God, knowing that that is a means that God will use. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for what we have seen here this evening. First and foremost, just of who you are. Thank you for this reminder, Lord, that you are a mighty and powerful God and that no king or ruler or any other person can stand in your way. Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, please could you help us to be encouraged by that this week as we go on, as we press on in following you. Lord, that we look to you who is in charge of all things. 
And Lord, would that encourage us then to pray to you? Lord, knowing that as we pray, nothing that we ask is impossible for you. So Lord, would you stir us, stir our hearts. Spirit, come and embolden us. Embolden us and encourage us to pray. Encourage us to pray, knowing that as we pray, that is a means that you have chosen to work through. Lord, we, are, we don't understand that completely. And yet, Lord, we want to we wanna live in light of that. So make us more and more a prayerful people. And then, Lord, would you help us to be speaking, speaking boldly your word, that it would be said today, just as it was said back then, that your word is increasing and multiplying. Lord, we long for that in our city. Please do that work here. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're going to um, close our time together by singing this song, King of Kings. It's a song we've sung a couple times here before. And just towards the end, we see here, it picks up on the book of Acts. Verse 4 will say, And the church of Christ was born. And the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint. Today, that same gospel message, the word of God is going out. So let's stand as we uh, finish, as we sing together this song.
now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.